let's uh, let's go. Is there anyone who's willing to share the uh, meeting notes on screen so we can follow along? Okay, I, th I probably can. Let me clear a few things up and away we go. All right, can everyone see the share? Yep. Cool. All right. <clears throat> Fred, do we want to dive in? Have we lost Frederick? Sorry, uh, mute button was in a different screen. <laughs> Anyways, um, cool. so let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, so please add yourself to the attendees list if you have not done so already. If you need help with adding yourself to the attendee list, let one of us know and we will add you to that uh, in case you're dialing in or, or otherwise. Uh, okay, so Agenda bashing, is there any conversation or any topic that anyone would like to have that is not on the list? Okay, I'm gonna assume that people are either on mute or don't have anything to say. So, um, events, we have at the end of this month, Mobile World Congress. So um, these... on. I, I was on mute, as you say. Um, I, I was just saying that, that I keep asking for an architecture discussion and it would be nice to have it this week if possible. Sure, add it to the agenda. So I think the agenda lists are not that long today and I think we should absolutely, I think, I think we, we should get to it. Mm -hmm. You say that with such faith. I always say it with faith. <laughs> Once more, Ian, with feeling. So, so Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. So these have a tendency to aim more towards demos that are more service provider centric, um, NFE use cases and so on. Um, so I will, I will be heading over there uh, for the conference. So if anyone has any recommendations on people that I should go talk to or companies I should go uh, talk to in terms of getting them added to our network service mesh fold, uh, please let me know and I will go have discussions with them. Or if you're gonna show up, we can go have a drink together. We have um, service mesh day coming up in San Francisco in 2019, which reminds me, I need to put in a, uh, a talk on that. So uh, if you're in the area, um, Feel free to uh, to attend. I, th I think that that'll be something that it'll probably it'll definitely be more application um, service mesh oriented. Uh, but we're going to we're going to try to expand the scope a little bit. Um, open. So we have ONS North America in San Jose. The call for papers is closed. Um, that call for paper notification is not accurate. That's uh, that's a little bit more aggressive, so we need to find out what the real dates are going to be. Um, anyways, that's, that will be in San Jose uh, on April 3rd through 5th. And we have a couple talks that have been submitted, so we will see if they manage to get in. April 9th through 12th, we have upper side conferences with the MP, MPLS SDN NFV in Paris. Um, so I don't know if we have any uh, related talks there, but it, some of the content may be interesting. We have Container World. Uh, we call for paper is, clo is closing on February 8th, and this is in Santa Clara. So uh, another one that uh, we should definitely consider, uh, that we should definitely consider submitting in for. Um, I think, um, so we also have a co-located uh, event at at KubeCon. Actually, the Container World one I think is that that seems incorrect because I recall the Service Mesh Day being February eighth, and I think Container World had already announced their schedule. So we should uh, no, actually yes, 
Yeah, so that's uh, that's at the wrong location. So let's move that up. Yeah. So that uh, the paper got accepted, and uh, Frederick. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the basics of network service mesh. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm all, okay. So another thing probably uh, I want to add is like, okay. Uh, I'll let Frederick complete. Uh, we are also looking to uh, submit a demo uh, in the. Elephant booth for uh, ODL and uh, network service mesh integrated together. I just want to add to that to the list too. Cool. Can you uh, can you add it? I'll add it. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. So I think uh, some of the stuff got mixed up, um, so I fixed them up. So the service mesh day call for paper closes on February eighth. The container world has already had its call for papers complete and the schedule published, and we have a network service mesh discussion or a talk that is being driven by, by Prem from Lumina. So. Okay. So we also have KubeCon EU in Barcelona, Spain. Um, the call for papers for that is already closed as well. We're waiting for the notifications. And finally we have well, we also have some co-located events that will occur, such as the FIDO Mini Summit. Um, the details will be announced later on. Um, and we also have a KubeCon in, and CloudNativeCon and Open Source Summit all combined into one uh, in Shanghai, where the call for paper will close on February 15th. So if you are in or going to be in that area, um, feel free to submit a talk and if you need help with content let us know and we will help you and finally we have open networking summit ons in europe which is going to be in antwerp belgium the call for paper window for that is still pending uh, so we'll get more information on that later um, we don't have any announcements listed so let's jump straight into the agenda so uh, so we start off with uh, stars, and so we we have one of our uh, minor goals coming up is that we would like to be a part of the CNCF landscape. Part of the uh, part of what the requirement is, if you're an open source project, or one of the triggers to become a um, a CNCF landscape project, is to have lots of stars, and that number is 300. So uh, and invite any people that you think are would be interested in starring our project to come in and start it so we can jump it from i think it's around 600 or sorry it's around 60 at the moment so we so we need to bump that up to around 300 so um so feel feel free to to invite anyone else that that you can find who would be willing to start uh help us start so that we can we can land on that uh on that uh page uh, is there anything else you want to add to that, Ed, or is that uh, is, is that good? You might be on mute. Yeah, you are on mute. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I'm adding a link to the repo here real quickly. Let me make sure I get it right, actually, uh, so you can go click to star. There we go. So yeah, folks could go, and if you haven't started the project yet, if you could please go start, that would be great. Cool, next we have uh, some specifications. So the, there are two document, uh, documentation efforts I would like to try to get the community to drive. So the first one is a high level component view. Uh, so in other words, things like we have a network service mesh daemon, we have a set of clients, and we have uh, an endpoint and so on. So just what are those high level things? So um, on this, Frederick, yeah. um, and not to gang up on you and Ed with Ian here, but um, I, I mean, I know that there's several of us that are more than willing to you know, help work on this, but um, you know, I've been anecdotally harassing it on uh, Google chat, trying to get answers to questions and collecting data, but actually having like um, a full run down of like, these are all the bits, this is how they all fit together. Here's what we want people to see here. Here's what we want to gloss over. 
you know, et cetera, et cetera, I think it'd be really helpful because what I don't want to do is spend a ton of time documenting things that are wrong, if that makes sense. No, that makes total sense. Um, so I guess the, the question is, what's the most expeditious way to run through some of that, um, you know, from your point of view? Because what I could do is go take some time to actually jump on a call with folks. We could sort of walk through some of the what's there. Um, we've got a reasonable project on the abstract architecture, et cetera, that we could talk through and sort of get to the particulars. Uh, we could, I could answer and drill down onto questions around that. From that, you guys could start generating you know, basic things like a gloss would be awesome. That yeah, that, that's kind of what I was thinking. I mean, we can either do it in like this Tuesday meeting or maybe we set up, you know, a specific meeting with like the people that are in that little group that we started. But, um, you know, like obviously you don't need to create a, a, an architecture to then present to us because then obviously that defeats the whole thing. I was just going to reuse some of the existing pretty pictures that I've got. Um, yeah, and maybe walking us through some of the code and stuff, yeah, right? Like, I, I think like, it's important that your pretty pictures, if they were going to solve the problem, they would have solved the problem by now, which is why we need your input as well. Oh, no, no, I'm not saying just go look at the slides. I'm saying let's jump on a call. Uh, we can talk through some of this. I'm happy to walk through some of the code. And as you know, and if as we need graphical aids, I've got a bunch of graphical aids in, on hand. Yeah, I mean, I'll definitely reuse work, but I, I think that would be helpful is for us to just get in an environment. Let's look at the different processes running. Let's take a look at some of the manifests. Let's take a look at like how things are stitched together. Like, you know, yep. if we're going to describe I, what a network service endpoint is, I need to like legitimately know what I, it is, right? Absolutely delighted to do that. Um, let's do the following thing. Like, I'm happy to sit down with the folks who want to do the documentation. Um, I do want to make sure to keep the actual calls public so that anybody who wants to sort of come in and participate can. I suspect that this Tuesday call is getting sufficiently crowded that it probably won't be the right venue because we, we do tend to be running up against the line. Um, so I guess the question is, would you be willing to go start a doodle poll uh, for a time that we could put together um, for folks to get together on a call and sort of talk the documentation volunteers um, through whatever it is they need to be talked through? Um, you know, and, and I'd be happy to do that. And we can, you know, basically do like an hour a week until you guys are satisfied. Um, as long as docs are coming out of it, it's a more than ample, more than useful investment of time. Yeah, I think that would be helpful to have like an architecture review call in conjunction with this. Because I mean, this one we're focused on like who's speaking at what, you know, what features do we want to add? So yeah. a more like technically focused call in parallel with this one, I think would be helpful. Yeah, so if you could go and, and kick off like a doodle poll or something, uh, and make sure to CC the public list and we'll just sort of figure out a time and start doing it. Sound good? Yep, sounds good to me at least. Yeah, and so the reason I added some of these was exactly for this reason. I want people to make suggestions as to what will be helpful for them. So my thought was we could like we could probably start with a high level component view but if there's a if there's some specific area you feel would be much more effective then we absolutely should start with those first yeah. i mean one of the things i want to be super clear about is um you know effectively the folks who are working on putting together documentation in some sense have a much better view of the kinds of gaps in the current explanations than i do or than i suspect frederick or nikolai does because if we magically knew what the gaps were we would just go fill them um, so, you know, it, it's super, super useful to have another set of eyes looking at things, asking questions and figuring out how to express them. Yeah, I fully agree with you, Ed. Uh, um, in fact, uh, I'm also talking to the folks and I'm getting questions collected out of it. For example, one of the things that has come in is uh, the security aspect of it. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, it's important that uh, we collect it and then we document those, agree. Okay, so we also, um, so I've also added a request for a coder, but it looks like Nikolai has already filled, uh, filled in a, an assignment. So basically we have a readiness and life probe uh, that has been spec'd out as a very easy uh, first um, first project or first thing to do. So, um, um, sorry, Frederick. One question I have is uh, with respect to the uh, 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 to do items. Uh, 
do we need to have special privileges to access this because I don't have the add card option and the and the board. Um, so let me let me sort of this is a bizarre detail of GitHub. Um, so basically, if, if what you're talking about is I went to try and assign myself to a bug and I couldn't. Um, effectively, with GitHub, you can't assign yourself to an issue for a repo. In fact, I can't assign you to an issue for a repo if you're not listed at least as a read-only collaborator. Okay. Um, and so if anybody is like, hey, I want to pick up a shovel, could you please add me to the list of read-only collaborators? Just give me your GitHub ID. I'm happy to do that um, for whoever wants to, right? Because then you can assign yourself to issues and, and that kind of stuff. Sure. I love that. Yep. Thanks. So, yeah, I, 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 I understand why GitHub is that way, and it makes sense, and they're actually right, but it is a little inconvenient at times. So we have a minor Slack revolt going on in the chat, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> okay. I, mean, I, I can tell you that there, there are potentially minor complications on Slack. I, I would have to check and see um, if the, you know, basically, Slack has a pricing model that's a little bit unfriendly for open source projects. And I know that that has been somewhat solved by other projects in CNCF. Um, and I could see if we could solve it in a similar way. But I, I have also heard people mention spectrum.chat as an alternative uh, to Slack. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm totally open to having the discussion if somebody wants to add it to the agenda. Yeah, my, my personal preference uh, at this time would be to keep IRC until we join a project like the CNCF who can put the bill and um, manage users and all that kind of stuff. So, because then it, it turns into having yet another tab in, in the Slack app. And when I already have <laughs> 10 to 15 tabs and it makes it, yeah, unwieldy. So, I, yeah. But, but, um, I, I suspect Slack will end up happening eventually um, when we when we join up with, uh, with with a group like the CNCF or, or quick something. question quick question for the folks who are highly in favor of Slack, which is a totally cool thing, right? Um, so is part of that because IRC is either a pain in the ass to access or blocked by your employer? The first one, and also I have the inverse opinion of Frederick. I'd rather have 15 channels than one chat application as opposed to having 30 different chat applications. Yep. No, I, I, yeah, I that, that, that's a no, no, it's not, the argument, is it? But the, the, it's, it's, I mean, the biggest the, issue I'm finding with IRC uh, so far is when you actually chat in there, nobody answers, one. Um, but two, when people chat in there, then I, I haven't, unless someone is recording the channel, I haven't actually seen a record of anything which means that, that it's said to people who are present at the time and then it's lost for all time. Yeah, so there, there are a couple of things there and, and you know, I, I'm not saying these are, by the way, perfect responses. So one of them is a lot of folks use something like IRC Cloud, which keeps you always on and therefore keeps an always going record of the channel. Um, the other one that I will mention is, and this is, this is sort of weird, so Freenode actively asks projects not to build public archives of their channels. Um, and that's a little weird, but but most projects I know have actually decided to respect that so far. Um, right. So maybe the easier answer here, rather than chat up, is we get a lot more consistent about using the mailing list for things. I find mailing lists enormously less productive than chat apps. Well, they are when you don't use them. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's it, it's one of these things where, quite honestly, the, the communities fall in different places depending on the personalities of the communities. Um, I'm happy to engage with folks on whatever medium they reach out to engage. So for example, um, I've responded to, uh, we've had a small number of emails that have hit the mailing list and I've been careful to make sure to respond to them. Um, so, you know, if folks reach out of the mailing list, absolutely that's fine, but most people prefer a more direct collaboration. Um, as to folks not answering, I know that the channel is actually pretty flipping active, um, particularly morning specific time because we've got a lot of folks working in Europe um, who are on the channel then. So, you know, lots of stuff goes on on the channel. So I'm, I'm not quite sure. Well, let me, let me highlight um, where, where this tends to be a problem, right? Jeff's trying to document the architecture, mm -hmm. which has been agreed among people, presumably largely on IRC, 
which means we've got no record of the agreement or why they chose to do it that way or anything. That I think is is a fine example of why yep. we're running into problems oh, no, the, right now. The agreement was from last week in the meeting, which you weren't present in. So uh, that was not actually on IRC. No, but, I mean, uh, that may have been, that was in fact, last week in the IRC meeting, the agreement we document the architecture. The agreement on the architecture goes back a long while before that, or else you wouldn't have written any code by now. So my point stands that, that there's some of this stuff where there's early discussions that, that are known by the people that had it. Well, and part of what's actually happening right now, where we're trying to get better about that, and I've just switched to the spec board, is we're, we're, we're trying to encourage the writing of specs um, so that they're actually structured in a way that's intentionally designed um, for there to be conversation around them. And sort of a good example of this right now um, is the monitor, the basically the metrics piece of the spec that's been going on. And I know um, Matthew and I have had a very active collaboration around that. Um, so, you know, basically we do have spec issues that are coming up. We do have the review of the spec board that's literally the next agenda item up uh, in the meeting. Um, and the way they're structured typically is there is an issue. Then the issue will point to a Google Doc because it's easier to collaborate there. And then once we figure out what we're doing, that will roll into the issue so it can be executed on. Yeah, that's the that's the end because like you are you are correct. Like doc people talking on IRC, it's like even finding it in the patch, even if you have an archive, is a pain in the ass. So this so that that was the idea towards driving towards these specs was let's find a way to get the community to surround and to start working on things in, in an area. And I don't want to tell people you can't talk on IRC or you can't talk on Slack or in person or or wherever, but whatever comes out of that should drive through this particular through this particular process. And we'll evolve this process to to uh, to be more uh, accommodating to people as well over time. So right now we're we're just getting started with this. So, well, I mean, the, the other thing I want to be super clear about is this is also not the OpenStack Blueprint process, right? This is a way to try and encourage collaboration. It's not a mandatory gate in the system, right? So a lot of us who've been very active are trying to utilize it because we think it improves community engagement. Um, but if you have some piece of work you, you need to do, and you, the the notion of going and writing a blueprint or a spec or whatever seems overwhelming, um, you don't have to, right? But it will probably lead to easier contribution because the spec will also often point out details like, oh yeah, if you could change that, this over here is probably also a good thing to change and that kind of thing. So, um, okay, so we seem to have muddled the agenda somewhat. Um, I think we need to make sure that we capture having the discussion about Slack in the, in the agenda. Um, if someone could please add that. And then we have a couple of other items as well. Um, Everybody, yeah. everybody on the pro Slack team, okay with making sure we capture it on the agenda, and then we'll get to it here shortly. Sounds, uh, sounds like that's the. Okay, so it added the uh, pro Slack group on there. So let's let's jump into the uh, into the NSM release process because we still have a lot to go through. So uh, Nikolai, you're uh, you're up. Do you, want me, I, do you want to share or do you want me to to just you know follow it? I prefer to share. Take it then. It's all yours. Okay. <coughs> and it should be this one. Okay. I hope you see my. Screen shared, at least the browser. <clears throat> okay, so um, in sync with whatever we already said about the specs, so I have initiated this NSM release process spec, and it's in a in a doc here. Uh, so this is just a quick uh, kind of announcing that this thing exists. Please go there, read it. Um, we have at least one thing that we would like the voting from you, uh, it would be the code naming. So we have two ideas already. And if someone has more ideas, please add them here. I know that uh, we can talk on Zoom on whatever, but as we said, it needs to be documented somewhere. So um, 
Yeah, uh, I don't want to go into much details here. We already exchanged uh, some messages uh, with uh, Ed uh, here. Um, uh, we, there is some proposal for the release numbering scheme when we call something stable, uh, when not. Uh, then we have a list of release materials, uh, which we improving. We are improving. We have improved a little bit, and we are continuing to improve. So if you have some other ideas, please add them here. Um, uh, at least a message, uh, if if not directly editing the the, the the document. And uh, then we have a um, kind of proposed dates, which look good so far. Uh, for our first uh, release. Um, so we have end of April um, as a kind of set as a target date and then um, kind of a first patch release before, just before the KubeCon. Uh, the overall idea here is that we have, uh, and this is actually the second thing that I wanted to share here, is that we have a <clears throat> project board here where we are adding the to-do in progress and done items. And uh, um, my proposal was that uh, each of these work group calls, we do a quick, even for five minutes, just to go and see what is in to-do, if you want to add something more in the to-do, um, and uh, kind of just move the things around here and uh, groom the, the, and have a realistic view of what's going on with the release. Um, I think this is good. I would love to see more folks participating in the conversation about the release process. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, as I sort of look at the release process, there are a small number of things that we absolutely have to agree as a community on. Right? Yeah. A lot of good stuff in the release process, but there's a small number of things we have to come to an agreement about. And I'm not suggesting we necessarily agree about it this week, but we probably should next week or at the latest the week after. Yeah. And I, th I think those things fundamentally come down to what is the intended release date? Um, are we okay with, you know, what is the intended throttle branch pull date? Um, are we okay with the branching structure of just pulling a throttle branch or a release branch from master, which most people do, so I expect that's okay. And then the one thing that I actually kind of like about this, but I've not seen before, is the notion of essentially treating the micro version zero as a release candidate and the micro version one as the first stable patch on the thing. Mm -hmm. um, I like that very much, but it's not something I'd seen before. So I want to make sure that that's something that we all understand and agree with. Does that make sense to folks? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> so there, there is no alpha or beta release? So, um, go ahead. Yeah, not really. So the, the idea is that, uh, okay, so this, we have a concrete dates here, so it may be easier to, to explain. So the first, so like one week before the, the, the date of the tag, of the first tag, we create the branch and we start ensuring that uh, uh, everything that we have in our to-do list here is kind of done or, comp or nearly to be done. Uh, and then uh, one week later, so this is on the 30th, we, we essentially tack the first release. We start running all the uh, CI, CD, extra testing, whatever we find appropriate. Uh, and then we probably find some you know, small issues, I don't know, uh, uh, bugs, performance, whatever you find. Uh, so two weeks later, after we we are kind of completely sure that we, we run through all the things. I mean, this is not completely specified as what this extending testing would be. It's just like a way to say, okay, you have two weeks to, before you declare that this is something that you consider stable. And once it gets to 1.1 or actually 0.1 uh, as a minor, uh, it's not the patch, it, it's actually the patch version. Uh, so once you get to, patch version one, uh, you say, okay, so this is stable. So this is something that's proposed here. Uh, it might work, it might not work. It's kind of driven by the fact that we want to go with the same ver uh, uh, versioning. Um, and um, 
I guess that adding some, you know, key characters in the end, like if you want to add here kind of beta or something like that, that's not exactly fitting into the same world. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's actually kind of part of why, I, even though I've not seen it before, I, 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 I sort of found some nice benefits to this approach. Um, you know, but I, I, I do understand, I think, the point that was made about wanting to have an alpha or a beta version. In some sense, the, um, you know, and sometimes people call them release candidates, et cetera. In some sense, I think what you're suggesting is that we treat the micro version of dot zero as essentially release candidate or beta, correct? Yeah, yeah, something like that, yes. Does that sort of match the concern of the folks who raised the alpha beta thing? Actually, it really makes sense because uh, we used to deploy only uh, dot one or dot two releases. And so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what you're saying is you wouldn't trust us anyway until it's not one or not two. So yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think so that's what confirms the wisdom of this approach. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But uh, okay, so just please go there at your c c comments. That's that's what we want and what we need. Uh -huh. so and the there, more we get, the better. Okay. There's a ton of other good things in this document, other than just sort of the small number of things, um, and they're good for setting direction, and I like them a lot. Um, but the the sort of the community agreeing on sort of the dates and the basic sort of branching versioning structure, those are things we have to all agree on. You know, the other stuff is, is you know, much more malleable um, over time. I mean, it provides good guidance and focus, but if somebody comes in and says, well, you know, I fervently believe that, you know, the first release should have SRV6, and so I'm going to go work on that. Well, okay, sure. Um, that's not actually a problem. But if somebody says, oh, your release date is terrible, and by the way, I, I want to use year, year, month, month versioning, okay, that's not something we all have to agree on, right? Yeah. Sense? Um, okay, so yeah, I guess that we we're going to go through this next week again, and I hope that we get some comments by then. Yep, and my hope is that next week that we can sort of come to agreement that okay, these will be the dates mm -hmm. we're the branching and versioning structure, etc. So particularly if folks are, you know, have differing views about that, like that that train is leaving the station probably next week. Yeah, and even even just a simple plus one somewhere just is somehow voting and saying okay, I approve. So yeah, it, it's super super helpful when you're trying to plan things. Just if if you just agree, just agreeing silently is so much less helpful than agreeing vocally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. And the last thing that uh, I had in my list for announcing uh, is uh, this um, the existence of this new. A repo under the network service mesh uh, github um, so this is uh, an attempt to have a separate infrastructure which will allow you to easily build um, applications if you want to call or kind of full featured examples uh, and uh, proof of concepts or demos uh, while relying on uh, as less as possible from the full network service mesh repo so there is some documentation here. Uh, of course, a lot of the structure was uh, copy pasted from the original repo, and a lot of the things were just cut down and stripped down to, to, to the very, very, very basic minimum that you want. So essentially, you can spin up a vagrant, and then you can just deploy the basic infra, uh, and uh, it's all in here. But uh, I just want to show you what the uh, Adyen can an example uh, is. Uh, no, it's not here. It should be here. Sorry. Um, so uh, there is the README which explains what you need to do, but it's very, very, very easy. So <clears throat> there is this make file, uh, which essentially just describes the name of the example, and then uh, all the containers that you need to build, which are, should exist as folders here under the example. Then all the pods that are going to be deployed. This eventually reflects to the naming of the YAML files that are going to be applied. And then you can add a check command 
and from there on all the targets uh, all the make file targets that are that are needed they are generated automatically by just including this target make file so um the, the purpose here was to, to to really make it easy without knowing much and without going into all the details of the built infrastructure uh to to, to just be able to to add all the all the, the pieces I, that you need i, I particularly yeah. like this because there's a psychological weight to a long make file, even if you only have mm -hmm. to change one thing in the, the first yeah. few lines of it. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that there isn't a lot of lines visibly following, I think is gonna also be good um, in this case. So um, one other thing I did wanna comment on, um, I'm actually super happy that we've now got the examples repo. And while I don't think there's any great urgency, I think it would probably be good to migrate some of the existing examples in that direction. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's actually gone on in the main repo, um, is even though the main repo is only about 22,000 lines of code, thematically, it's kind of gotten a little bit big. There's just a lot of things in the main repo. Um, and so starting to more intelligently use um, other repos is probably all for the good. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. one of the things that I want to, to just start ex explicitly here that here we don't build uh, any of the core uh, containers, so NSMD, the data plane, all these things are essentially pulled off the GitHub. So, uh, for example, here in the IFRA, when you want to build the monitoring, these are just the same YAML files that you find in the main uh, repo, but they just uh, rely on the fact that you can download the, the, all the containers uh, of the Docker Hub. Um, yeah, so that was it. Um, one other thing I did want to throw out there, we've got a lot of make, make file machinery and it's done lots of useful things. But um, one of the things, if there's someone who's interested in working on it, that would be super cool is a lot of the stuff we're using the make file machinery for probably could be better done with Helm at this point. And so if someone is interested yeah. in doing some Helm charts to sort of make things go more smoothly, that would be super welcome. I was going to say that next, but you beat me to it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Another uh, another yeah, nice problem. Most authoritatively, is, is the, the make machinery is my fault. So <laughs> another another nice property of this as well by having the examples and migrating them here is that we want to tell when we're breaking the community. And as we know, not all changes are uh, are structural in nature. So if there's something that semantically breaks with uh, in a change then these examples act as uh, integration tests where since they haven't been, ref since they haven't been refactored or as part of the main uh, core, we're more likely to catch those type of, uh, of behavior changes and, um, and be able to report them uh, as, uh, as breaking changes or make a, make a decision to refactor back to the non-breaking version. Uh, so, so I think even though this will cause a little bit of extra work on the CI side and and in the core development side, I think it has immense benefits to the community from a uh, from a CI perspective. Yep. Okay. So please, I mean, try it. Send issues, uh, suggestions, uh, more than welcome. Uh, okay, so with so with this, I'm actually stop, stopping my sharing of the screen here, and uh, oh, who's next? Okay, so so we, Ian, do we have enough time to discuss your? Uh, we, it's been put off for four topic. weeks, so let's do what we can do in 10 minutes, um, because I think we've got a, a fundamental issue here. So <clears throat> um, basically what we have at the moment as a theory is um, data planes connecting service endpoints to service clients. Um, and that has its uses, and as have been demonstrated at um, KubeCon, as an example, and that's fine. But the issue I run into is that it seems to me that um, firstly, we've got two problems with this model. One is that we're talking endpoints and clients as if there's producers and consumers of network um, uh, of networking, uh, which I don't think is how the world works. Because if you look at physical networking, then when you connect a router to a switch, you don't call one an endpoint and one a client. That's not how it works. So there's that. Um, 
The other one is that um, as things go, the data planes that we've built, they've been using uh, Kubernetes networking as their connectivity um, just to get, make a point and get things passed out the door, which is you know fine as far as it goes. Um, but practically speaking, um, uh, if you're doing, uh, if you look at NFE as an example of how fast networking works, then um, 50 percent of this is done with SRIV interfaces for speed, and also um, you can't ignore the physical infrastructure when you're trying to work out what connectivity you've got. So you know if my Kubernetes boxes are all connected to a router versus a switch, then that gives me um, different use cases, different behavior. The same data plane won't necessarily work with both. So um, I think the question I had was, um, and I think the reason we've managed to avoid this so far is we haven't really looked at the lowest level of this, what we're building from. Oh dear, I think my headset's gone flat. Hello? I can still hear you. You All right, that's fine. Sorry, my, my headset just went. You're definitely not talking. Um, to <laughs> right. So, so my my take on this is, and the reason I want to call this an architecture topic, is I think what we're doing is we're building um, the house without building the foundation. Um, we've got a um, fairly good idea of what a service mesh would be for people who want to consume it as a mesh, but we haven't got a way of building a service mesh because we haven't talked about the low level building blocks that we ought to be building with, um, you know, providing without giving them privileges, providing a container with an SRIV interface to take one example, um, providing a container with a MEMIF, which isn't really, or providing two containers with a shared MEMIF, um, that kind of thing, um, so that we're, we're building on a platform that lets us so, do the, the sort of meshy so, things that people are excited um, with. Two containers with shared MEMIFs. Um, has been working since October or November. I understand that. I wasn't saying that it didn't work. I was saying that it's not really a separable building block. Um, I mean, we, we talk at the moment in terms of a data plane that connects um, a client to an endpoint. And setting aside the point about there not necessarily being things like clients and endpoints, um, there might not be a data plane involved here either. You might just want to connect uh, two containers together for fast networking purposes uh, on the same host, which you know are on the same host. So, Ed, and I know you know that I had some questions around this too, right? Like, because yep. MIMIF works great if I'm on the same host and there are gonna be instances where I will wanna dictate, you know, to an application built of microservices that, hey, I, I want to make sure that this is how you deploy. But I mean, you know, this whole concept of us going truly cloud native, right? Like not recreating OpenStax problems too is, I would also like the alternative if I do have an extremely, you know, fast and powerful fabric sitting above this, you know, if I've, if my network engineers have taken the time to actually put this whole spine and leaf thing above me, then um, I would also like the potential ability to intelligently create services um, where the containers have their own interfaces and I just use the physical network northbound to do all this, right? Without necessarily introducing no, no, a bottleneck with a network service endpoint. And I think Ian and I are kind of both wrapping our heads around this from like different angles, but are trying to reach the same. Oh, yeah. I, I tend to agree with you. And so here's the thing I would, I would sort of say there, Jeff, Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. so definitely the ability to treat an SRIOV uh, VF as the sort of local mechanism that's plugged into your container, definitely that's something that needs to be done. Yeah. Okay. But uh, how, how do we treat the switch as a network service of some variety, or an element of networking? The, the way that I have been con conceptualizing in my own mind um, the physical network around this is that if you want, and this is one way to conceptualize it, is if you think of the Tor port, the top of rack switch port, that you know, let, let's, let's put aside the SROV for a second. Let's just talk about the physical net. We'll come back to the SROV because I agree it's important, but the story is easier to tell originally without it. So if I just have a physical NIC um, that I've plugged into my container as a local mechanism, um, I would actually like it to be the case that it gets from the physical network some kind of treatment, right? And <clears throat> from the and from my point of view, effectively what that means is that the Tor port that that NIC is plugged into 
is in fact providing some kind of a network service that you would like it to provide. Um, and so that's how I've been sort of conceptualizing this so far. Give me just one second and let me dig up the sort of scribbles I've done well, so far to see if they help. Well, well, to take you from there, right, then that says that a data plane is a network service and a data plane consumes a network service as well if it's using the Tor to actually get its connectivity host to host. And if that's the case, then I don't necessarily use a data plane to connect one network service to another. So my point is that our lowest level of building block before we start talking about meshes, you know, it, it, and I use the equivalency here and I don't want you to get distracted with the way that we're integrating with Envoy, but my point is that Envoy is a form of networking that builds on Kubernetes na native networking. So there's a high level and a low level. Feels to me here like we've got the high level, but we haven't got the low level here where we've got things that, you know, don't need connections that reach across from host to host, we just need touch points, if you like, very local things that are on host or host to network. But it also feels like um, if we take, if we look at what's inside a network service, then we've clearly got a control plane element and a data plane element. And the control plane element has a certain API that we like and we respect and is, you know, defined by NSM. But the data plane element could be, you know, VPP in a container, or it could be the kernel being controlled by a container, but it could equally be um, the physical switch or the physical router. No, so, no, and if, I, I'm completely fine with all that. So um, I, I've been trying to break off some time to draw, to sort of lay out some of the pretty picture pieces. Um, I've got some scribbles that I could talk to if that would be of assistance at this point, um, if folks are interested. Is that something you guys would be interested in at this moment? Uh, yes, Ed, uh, I have similar questions and I'll be interested in that. No, no, it, it's a perfectly valid set of questions. Yep. Uh, you know, and, and sort of part of the reason I haven't written them down yet is I first need to write down the inter-domain stuff. Um, for it well, to be let, let me ask you a different question before you start down this. What, could I run NSM with no data plane at all? Mm, no, not currently. And why not? Because something has to be able to handle making sure that you're actually connected to the network service that you want to connect it to. And something has to be able to do that for you. But if it's local to me, if it's local to my host or, you know, again, the, the physical switch, then I don't need a data plane for that. So I, I think perhaps the semantics of the word data plane are getting in the way here. So well, I'm looking at your definition as you've written it uh, because again, your code defines it at the moment. Yeah. So, um, Mm -hmm. Hello, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I, I'm having a lot of trouble hearing, but I think this is a conversation that's real relevant to me. So please uh, yell at me if I, or yell very loud at me if I am stepping on or, uh, or uh, repeating something that was already said. I think some of this might be clearer if we implement bare metal uh, bare metal services and infrastructure on the, like for example on packet.net and put VPP on the data plane and then use use uh, use Memeth to connect to the pod and then have um, and then uh, the, the data plane uh, the network service mesh data plane abstraction would quote no unquote how to tell uh, well, uh, the real uh, VPP data plane, for example, how to set up the kinds of connections we're, we're looking for. And, um, and I think most of that is probably there where we are. Um, but um, it, it, to me, that's connected in some way to the SRIOV discussion, the MPLS discussion that, that Ed and I have, that I think if we, if we implement our our real network that like, for example, in the CI that that way, so we, we do have a severe some of this might fall out and I'm trouble oh. hearing you, Ed. Oh. So I'll, I'll speak extremely loud, not because I'm in any way upset, but to try and help Tom here. Um, we have a challenge here in that Intel either. So one of the following things have to be true. We either have to use a mechanism for talking to the NIC that is not DPDK or we have to, or DPDK has to change to be more tolerant of not getting the pneumozone that it wants. Or 
Kubernetes has to allow you to actually manage the numism correctly, which it doesn't currently, and I don't know when that's landing. Um, or we have to use some alternative mechanism. Um, like for example, we do have native AVF drivers that can talk to SRIO VNIX without the DPDK problems, and we could potentially use those. But there's mm -hmm. a little, oh, there's one, there's one remaining option. We could turn off the second socket on the server, but there's a fundamental mismatch where DPDK is very insisted the world has to be precisely the way it wants it. And that's just not how cloud native works. Yeah, that's fine. That, so this is good, right? You're naming things that need to resolve themselves in order for us to make things useful. And that's completely acceptable. So where's that on our tracking? Um, so I'm happy to put that on the tracking. None of those are actually problems that lie within our hands. One of them no. is- Well, I've got the DPDK hands, community so has to come around to the, the DPDK community has to change its mentality and from- We are, can be a part of the DPDK community as well. But, but, but uh, maybe, maybe I, can, uh, I can go from a, an end user potential, potential end user viewpoint is I agree a bit with Yen, is NSM as a mesh, would reside whether you decide to have, like I'm a fan of SRV6, but you could have all your hosts running SRO V ports, or you can actually hardwire the NIC directly to a container if you want to. The notion of being able to abstract how the service mesh is actually represented in physical, is an, it's kind of independent. You have your pick and choose, and you might go fast with BTP, but it ends up being sometimes you're gonna have something else. So those those iterations of how to, how to represent the data plane of an MSM will evolve over time. Absolutely. Being able to abstract, being able to abstract them to, to understand that there is, for example, locality services. If an NSC is, for example, an SROV port, you, darn, you have to have the logic inside the NSM to say, well, if my, my client needs a, 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 an NSC, an SROV NSC, please make it on the same host. And the, the plumbing that, underneath that part, is, to make sure that part is easy. The part, that's, the part that's broken, and the reason that I, I haven't been driving the SROV so hard, the part that's broken is that DPDK thinks, in deep, right now, DPDK Look, Ed, we, we understand that DPDK has got its problems and it's not going to work until we change it. That's totally fine. But my point is, let's stop avoiding this conversation because DPDK is broken, let's have it. Because we've got to work out how to fix DPDK for this. We can't run it in a container then we've got nothing, quite honestly. No, the, the problem is you can run it in a container, um, but you can't run it in a container in Kubernetes, in a pod, right? This is the thing to keep really clear. There's a huge distinction between container networking and cloud native networking. And this is a sort of a central example of that. Now I yeah. have reached out to people who work on DPDK to try and get this fixed. And I'm also tracking efforts in Kubernetes to have a cloud native way of doing NUMA uh, Numa zones, and I would be really love to have more people involved in those discussions. But until those things get fixed, um, effectively, the only way to run anything that uses DPDK capacity inside a pod is to only have a single socket server. Yeah, fine. But when those things get fixed, then we come back to that question of we're not really, we, we, you're building, we are building today a, a thing which will connect a network service endpoint to a network service client, regardless of where they lie in, in the system. But I think we're building it from smaller building blocks, which is a, things that actually neighbor each other and touch each other, whether that's a switch to a container via an SROV interface or a container to a container via Nemeth. So what I was trying to say so, is that I think we've got a lower level of abstraction that we haven't really looked at yet. And yes, maybe it's because DPDK is not ready for us, but I think we need to be making our preparations. No, so I think I think basically what you're saying is you need to know what the story is for how this is going to work, um, and and so we can try at least the architectural level discover whether we are likely to have unforeseen issues, um, sort of you know and and try and get them resolved. And I think that's actually a super good idea and a super good point. The reason it has received less of my personal attention at this moment is I you know if I were to go off and write some code to try and do this, I literally can't realistically test it until either DPDK realizes that it's not going to have dictatorial control over yeah. the whole box. Hey, and, 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 so uh, before we, let, let me, before we continue know. on, hey, before we continue on, we're already a few minutes over, so we should uh, punt the- well, yeah, I do have to, yeah, I'm gonna say. I think, so, so 
I think that the key here is, I think, Jeffrey, you're going to get a doodle poll going to have some architectural discussions. Correct? I was going to say, so two things, Ed, is one, um, I have a direct line to the Intel development team, and they're always asking me what open source things that they can work on for me. Oh, so perfect. let's leverage the fact that I work for a giant SP and get people to work for us. And then second, um, I don't want to take a single bite of this and be told I can't have the rest of the meal. So can we save these slides and all that for like these architectural meetings since we're already over the hour? Yeah, I think that's probably the right place to do it. Um, absolutely. All right. So Ian, Ed, just, you know, get offline with me and I will look at flexing the charter muscles and seeing if we can get some Intel people to solve some of our challenges for us. All right, cool. Okay. Go ahead and include me in that as well. Uh, and thank you. Uh, closing it up at the same time next week. Uh, see you all there. Later, guys. Take care.